Have you heard about FDA-approved Vivgard Hytrulo, Fgartigamod Alpha, and Hyaluronidase QVFC for subcutaneous injection? Visit VivgardHCP.com to discover clinical trial data and explore patient profiles. Vivgard is a registered trademark of Argenix. Vivgard Hytrulo is a trademark of Argenix. This is Jose Merino, Editor-in-Chief of the Neurology Family of Journals. The Neurology Podcast provides practical information to neurologists and other clinicians to help them provide better care for their patients. Thanks for listening and have a great week. Hello and welcome. This is Justin Abutamarco here with Alice Tang to discuss her paper published in Neurology titled Herpes Simplex Virus Encephalitis in Patients with Autoimmune Conditions or Exposure to Immunomodulatory Medications. Alice is a PGY-4 neurology resident at Mass General Brigham Neurology Program with plans to subspecialize in neuro-oncology next year. Alice, hello and welcome. Hi, Justin. Thank you so much for having me. No, this is an exciting topic to talk about. We talk about this in the clinic a lot, but as you pointed out in your introduction, there are a lot of things that we don't know about this common infection. So maybe we could start there. What did we know about HSV encephalitis and what were the gaps in our knowledge? HSV itself, herpes simplex virus, it's so common worldwide. Mucocutaneous HSV affects 3.7 billion people. But the incidence of HSV encephalitis, which we neurologists see, is just a few cases per million annually. HSV is a bread and butter neurological condition. It's the commonest infectious encephalitis in adults. And really importantly, it's one that we can actually treat. Right now, we treat with acyclovir. And prior to using this antiviral, mortality was around 70%. This has now improved to 20%. That said, the morbidity is still very significant with most people, 70% or more, experiencing really severe or moderate to severe long-term disability from things like seizures, memory disorders, psychiatric sequelae. That's roughly what we know about HSVE, the course. The things we don't know include things like the pathogenesis, It's not traditionally thought of as an opportunistic infection, but it's so rare. That's why we looked at this particular cohort to understand if it's more common in patients with autoimmune disease and those on immunosuppressant and immunomodulatory medications. We don't yet know fully how this virus spreads, if it's hematogenous, if it's a reactivation, or if it's a new infection. So that's definitely a place for ongoing work that 20% mortality associated with cases that are properly treated right with our standard of care is really humbling. I think it highlights that this is a true neurological emergency. And again, we're not even touching on yet the comorbidities or sequelae that patients can have, you know, after their HSV and uh, cephalitis. So such important work for our neurologists to know on the front lines. So you and your group looked at the U.S. Medicaid database which for those outside the U.S. covers adults 18 to 65 years old to see whether certain autoimmune diseases or their associated medications increase the risk of HSV encephalitis. And you really took a broad look at this. Rheumatological diseases, inflammatory bowel disease, along with some of our neuroimmunological diseases like multiple sclerosis and myasthenia gravis. Obviously, when we're using the database-driven project with ICD codes, there's some limitations, but is there anything else we should know about the methodology? So just to give an overview, the U.S. Medicaid or Max database, we picked this one because it includes 75.6 million patients. And we initially performed a cohort study. From that, we did find a total of 3,667 HSV encephalitis patients. And they had an average follow-up of 2.2 person years. We were able to find that this resulted in an incidence for adults aged 18 to 65, which the database covers, of 0.3 per 10 to the 6 person years as an incidence. From this, we then did a subsequent matched case control study. Regarding our methodology, HSV encephalitis is a rare diagnosis. We did a 1 to 100 case control matching. And we did this to try and mimic a rare disease population. 
we looked at the cases between the years of 2007 to 2010. It's a U.S. database, and so it's from the 29 most populated American states. We aged and matched our adult cases of HSVE with sufficient enrollment period, which we called 12 months prior to the HSV diagnosis, to this larger control population, as I mentioned. We selected this enrollment period because we wanted to make sure that patients had sufficient exposure to either autoimmune disease or immunosuppressant and immunomodulatory medications during that time period. And what did you find when you did that really nice analysis trying to match these controls given this really rare disease? We found that both autoimmune diseases and immunosuppressive and immunomodulatory medication use were more than twofold more frequent in the HSVE cases than in their match controls. For autoimmune diseases, we found 28% had HSV encephalitis compared to 12% in the healthy control population. And regarding medication use, it was 21% compared to healthy controls with 10%. It's really remarkable finding some stark patterns. Did you see any temporal relationships in terms of the HSV encephalitis and their either diagnosis or medication use? Regarding study design, we tried to ensure that patients had sufficient exposure to either the autoimmune disease or the immunomodulatory and immunosuppressing medications prior to indexing. And so although we don't have the exact time period, the exact dose, the exact temporal relationship, we have tried to approximate that. These, unfortunately, are limitations of a database study using coded diagnoses. And I think a great next step would be to look at HSV PCR diagnoses. How about any other factors outside of autoimmune disease or medication use that you identified? So we additionally looked at baseline covariates in our matched case control study. We did find that comorbidities, including smoking, obesity, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, COPD, and heart failure were more prevalent in our HSV encephalitis cases than healthy controls. We also looked at the Charleston comorbidity index, which was higher in the cases than the controls. Fortunately, we found no difference in age, sex, ethnicity, or number of clinical visits between these populations. Alice, what did we see with non-autoimmune, non-medication-related comorbidities? Was there any association with some of our traditional vascular risk factors? We did see that demographic and socioeconomic covariates were very equally distributed between our cases and controls. There was a significant difference between non-autoimmune medical comorbidities, such as smoking, obesity, diabetes, CKD, COPD, and heart failure, This suggests in those with a diagnosis of HSV encephalitis, these patients are possibly medically more compromised in the six months prior to diagnosis. Um, These data do suggest that patients with a diagnosis of HSV encephalitis, in addition to having autoimmune disease being a risk factor, are medically more compromised, at least in the several months prior to indexing, prior to diagnosis, and that the pre-morbid exposure to these medical comorbidities are more prevalent in the HSVE population. And just to comment on that further, immunosuppression overall is hard to define. It covers a different spectrum of disease states and exposures. Our immune response can even be diminished by stress, age, sleep deprivation, as well as chronic non-autoimmune diseases like cancer. We focus on a narrow definition of immunosuppression, starting with specific autoimmune diseases and the medications used to treat them. This would be a great next step for our research. That's such a great point. I think we see this on a clinical basis. So many things can impact our immune function. That's why I really liked your comorbidity analysis outside of the autoimmune and medication set because diabetes, other oncological comorbidities, these can all impact patients' health and recovery from infections like this. But it does sound like we have this two-hit hypothesis here that these autoimmune diseases, associated medications, definitely increasing our risk along with these vascular comorbidities that you discussed. Is that right? Yes, I would agree with that. What else did we know about HSV encephalitis and immunocompromised patients? I know you had limited granular data on these patients, but in school, we always talked about these patients having like a muted immune response, you know, not having that classical fever or leukocytosis or other clinical signs when they come into the hospital. Is there anything else that we knew about 
that population in HSV encephalitis? I agree, Justin, that when we see these patients clinically, we have to have a very broad differential. They present with far fewer focal neurologic symptoms, increased disease severity, morbidity, and mortality. Very often, these patients aren't able to mount an inflammatory response, and they don't even fever. Often, we don't know how HSV encephalitis is transmitted, whether it's hematogenous spread, new infection, reactivation, and if it's different in this immunocompromised population. So really need that high index of suspicion again, especially when we're seeing some of the risk factors that we talked about here when visiting patients with new onset seizures, new temporal lobe abnormalities on MRI, things like that. Mm -hmm. How will you take this information into your clinical practice, Alice? I think in my clinical practice, when I encounter patients who have autoimmune conditions or they're already on immunosuppressant or immunomodulatory medication, I definitely have a lower threshold to consider HSV encephalitis on my differential in that population. For clinicians who are non-neurologists, considering the degree and duration of immunosuppression to put a patient on are also things that I would think about. Given that HSV encephalitis may result from a disturbance in immune surveillance, the role of antecedent immune dysregulation, we think, may have been underestimated. And anything else you want to share around these vulnerable populations? Overall central nervous system infections, especially in people who are immunocompromised, can result in significant morbidity and mortality. Even when patients survive, they can be left with devastating deficits. We definitely want to be asking questions such as, what puts people at greater risk? How can we better protect them? How can we improve their recovery? And these are the ones to move clinical practice forwards. No, I love that summary. I think it's a great way to end, right? A neurological emergency. We need to learn more about the risk factors and how to identify these patients really quickly so that we can treat them. Alice, I really appreciate your work on this topic. You can find the article in Neurology titled Herpes Simplex Virus Encephalitis in Patients with Autoimmune Conditions or Exposure to Immunomodulatory Medications. I also want to make a quick plug for the 2024 AAN Summer Conference, which will be taking place in Atlanta, Georgia, with a focus on autoimmune neurology, but a specific discussion around neuroinfectious diseases, where we'll be able to dive into data around HSV encephalitis and other related disorders. So if you can make it, please come out and join us in Atlanta this summer. Alice, thanks again for your time. Thanks, Justin. This is Stacey Clardy, your podcast editor. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please take a few moments to subscribe, rate, and review the Neurology Podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And remember, you can always head to neurology.org backslash podcast for our full list of past episodes, where you can also search by keyword in your podcast app for any neurology-specific topics you want to learn about.